This is A Different Perspective with Kevin Randall. A retired U.S. Lieutenant Colonel, Kevin Randall has been studying UFOs for nearly 50 years. Kevin has investigated some of the most famous UFO cases in the world and has been consulted for dozens of documentaries about UFOs. Considered one of the leading experts into the Roswell UFO crash of 1947, Kevin has written more than 25 books about UFOs, including the recently published Roswell in the 21st Century. Now, here is the host of A Different Perspective, Kevin Randall. And welcome to this edition of A Different Perspective. I am Kevin Randall. Before we get started and I bring on my guest, uh, Brian Dunning, I would like to say one thing. Uh, we keep talking about the book um, Roswell in the 21st Century. I have a companion book out now called Ros Understanding Roswell, and I think the two books kind of go together so that you get a better perspective about what really happened in Roswell and how some things developed uh, into storylines and how some things went astray. And I'm thinking specifically like the Glenn Dennis story of the ordering the, the child size coffins and meeting the nurse and how that story has kind of um, disintegrated with the investigations by UFO investigators and the skeptical community. I think um, the skeptical community looked at it and said, this story cannot be true. Ergo, it is not true. Uh, we in the UFO community actually embraced it in the beginning, but we also continued to investigate finding things that uh, Dennis was telling us that just simply weren't true. And I came to the conclusion oh, 20 years ago that the Dennis story couldn't be um, validated, that it wasn't, wasn't to be trusted. Uh, and that kind of detracts from the whole Roswell case, but that's outlined in both um, Roswell in the 21st century and understanding Roswell. So take a look at those two books um, as companion pieces. And if you're interested in a case I think is significant, take a look at uh, Level Land, which is a book that uh, came out not that long ago and looks at the Level Land sightings from 1957 in depth. I'm going to be joined here in just a moment with Brian Dunning. And he tells me that he is a science writer and author and also the executive director of Skeptoid Media. Uh, the site is mostly his gig. He has a press page there and his personal site is there as well. You can also follow him on Twitter and all the other social media stuff too. He lives in Bend, Oregon and can be found sometimes, he says, inside his Jeep or underneath it. And I'm not sure about the underneath it part. Um, the website is uh, skeptoid.com. That's S K E P T O I D.com. Brian Dunning, welcome to a different perspective. Thank you for having me. It's really good to be here, sir. What caught my attention, what dragged me to you, <laughs> was something I saw on the internet about the Belt Montana sightings from 1967 that were sort of in the same time frame as the missile shutdown at Maelstrom Air Force Base, uh, with some yeah. outside forces shut down the missiles. And I thought it would be interesting to talk about that. Now, I understand you have looked at the Belt Montana sightings a little bit, but you didn't look at them in depth. And what, what was the reason for that? Well, simply because it was so far away and a whole week apart. Um, I just couldn't see any reason that they might have had anything to do with one another. You know, uh, uh, for, for there to be a UFO sighting, a week from any other event. I mean, that's what happens every day year round. Um, so I don't see that uh, a UFO sighting could have caused something that happened 100 miles away and a week earlier. I think what we need to point out for those who may not be familiar with it is hmm. Maelstrom Air Force Base had a um, squadron of ICBMs or a larger unit of ICBMs but they're not located near the, the, the base itself. They're scattered all over the, the countryside. So that although you're assigned to Maelstrom Air Force Base, you might be, as you said, 100 miles or 200 miles away in a missile silo or a group of missiles uh, on, on your, as your duty station. So that's kind of where we get into the discrepancy. I was under the impression that some of the sightings took place uh, closer to the events at Maelstrom, uh, at, the, at the missile silos, um, there were a whole series of sightings I found kind of interesting. There was physical ev evidence left behind by uh, at least one of the sightings, but you really didn't study any of that? Well, no, I did. Um, you know, what you're talking about is the reports of, of, of the one guy, uh, Robert Solis, and virtually all of his colleagues said he his, how old were these memories at the time? Uh, 20, 30 something years, 
his memories were simply wrong, that those things just didn't happen on the same time or the same place. And with so the majority of people saying that it was wrong, uh, the official report saying that uh, the security guards who went around and checked everything said that he was wrong, I decided it's more likely that he was wrong than that he was the only person who was right out of all of these people. Well, let me let, let me t take a step back here because I was I was talking specifically about the sightings in Belt, Montana, and there was a whole group of people who saw UFOs uh, in that time frame, and, and by that time frame I mean the same month of 1967, yeah. and there were some very good sightings, and those are uh, I think outlined in the Project Blue Book files as well as the Condon Committee looked at those sightings as well. And yeah. so when I was talking about some of the physical evidence, I was talking about some of the physical evidence le left near Belt, Montana, as opposed to Maelstrom Air Force Base. Did you, did well, you that, look at those sightings? I didn't. I mean, that may well be, but we're talking about something that was a week after the incident at, at the Air Force Base. And so I just didn't see that this had anything to do with the story I was investigating, so I didn't bother. Okay, let's let's get into that, because there's two separate flights that supposedly were shut down by some outside influence. Um, you mentioned Robert Salas, who was involved yes. in the second event, whom I've actually talked to. Um, we did not hit it off. <laughs> I'm sorry um, to hear that. <laughs> I've had that experience, too. Um, uh, he somewhat of a um, less than uh, has not, not much of a sense of humor, I guess, is the way I should put it. Uh, yeah. We shared a table in Roswell at some point, and I was I would be making jokes, and he got a little bit miffed of, at, at me and moved his stuff off somewhere else. So that was kind of funny. And then I saw him in Washington D.C. later on. Um, but there was one flight. Uh, I think it was an Oscar flight that had the missile shut down. The flight that had the missile shut down was Echo Flight. Echo Flight, and yeah. that's extensively documented. However, his memory is that, and apparently, I think we can accept. Um, that he was an officer in the um, launch control facility that was affected. Um, his memory is that it was at Oscar, but all of the records and all, almost all of his colleagues say, no, dude, you're remembering it wrong. You were at Echo when that happened. So I think, I, I think the, you know, the, the default is that he was actually at Echo and misremembering. I do believe he's honest. I'm not saying he's lying. I do believe he's com completely honest in his... <clears throat> in his recollections, just simply mistaken. Well, I was going to say, um, my understanding from talking to him, and I, I could be in error here, was that there were events at two separate flights. Yeah. And one flight was completely shut down by some, some force that I don't think was adequately explained in the documentation I saw. Um, they suggested some kind of a, an internal glitch, which supposedly isn't, isn't possible. Uh, what did you find in your investigation? So my, my, my interpretation of why he says that there was these two events is that that's his, his way of rationalizing the way that his memory differs from everyone else's and from the official records. Well, let, me, is let, quite me, certain... let, me, let me interrupt here. I, I don't mean sure. to do it. I, you mis I think you're misunderstanding me. I'm ignoring Robert Salas at the moment. Okay. There was a flight missiles that were shut down. Yes. The entire flight went offline. Yes. My understanding was that the there was a, a substantial investigation, which because if that happens, it suggests some kind of force or somebody could adversely affect our, re, our retaliatory capabilities. So it becomes a matter of national security at that point. Clearly. And so there was a, a, a big investigation. My understanding was, based on what I saw in the Project Blue Book files and, and the Condon Committee report, was they did not come up with a satisfactory explanation of how that happened. Is that is that correct or not? Um, I I would say the explanation was satisfactory that they came up with. But let me just let me let me say how I how I went about um, investigating this. I okay. I first got the idea when I was watching the congressional hearings. What in May I believe it was, and they were they mentioned the fact that hey we now know that UFOs can shut down our our nuclear arsenal. And I'm like, wait a minute, what is this? Because I hadn't heard of this before. And so I, I did a little bit of investigating and I found Solace's book where he talks about what happened. And so I called a, a very good friend of mine who is a retired Air Force Colonel, a Lieutenant Colonel, who was a missile officer. He was a Minuteman Three missile officer. 
And I said, uh, his name's Lieutenant Colonel Hal Bidlack. He did give me permission to mention his name. Um, <clears throat> I said, Hal, what? tell me about this. What happened? And he said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And so I told him the little bit of the story about how it was at Malmstrom Air Force Base, 1967, and this happened. And he says, he said, the, the missile officer community is a very small one, and it's a very tight one, and we all know each other, and we all know everything that's ever happened. If something like that had happened, I would absolutely know about it. Not, not, not even maybe, but absolutely. So I did some more digging. I found, dug up all of the facts, and I got the, uh, the report from, from Boeing that did the technical inspection of, of the whole uh, system that was affected. And I gave it to him and we went through it together over the phone and he was explaining everything and giving context for everything. And it seems quite clear um, that what happened was the local power station, uh, Fergus Power, at their um, uh, one of the, the substation that was closest to Echo Flight, they had a transformer blow, which, as we all know, that periodically happens at power stations. Uh, this one was particularly finicky. Yes. Let me interrupt here because I'm going to have to take a break and we're getting we're getting to the meat. So I don't want to interrupt you when we get to the good part of the story there. OK, that sort of thing. Uh, we'll get into more about what happened here and uh, what Robert Salas had to say about all of this in just a moment. My blog is at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And oftentimes I have additional information available on the blog that doesn't get permit presented in the program and some additional information. And I looked at uh, these sightings at Belt, Montana and Maelstrom Air Force Base in, uh, I believe it was the government UFO files or a government, yeah, you know, the government UFO file. So you can take a look at that. We will be back right after this with Brian Dunning talking about uh, UFO shutting down missiles. So please stick around. <music> And we are back. I'm joined by Brian Dunning. We're talking about the uh, missile shuts down in Maelstrom Air Force Base in 1967, something that supposedly wasn't supposed to be able to happen. And you got involved with uh, your uh, friend who's a lieutenant colonel. Like you want to say, well, who isn't a lieutenant colonel for crying out loud? <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, it's kind of a joke there. So you were talking about, I guess, a power generator, a power station meltdown or uh, glitch that yeah. affected this. So continue with that. Yeah. So Fergus Electric Company, which is which is the municipal power supplier that supplied all of the launch facilities uh, in, for, for Echo Flight, uh, because that's the local area that they were in. Uh, they had a, a substation called the Winifred substation. They had a transformer blow. And there's records for all of this. And the power, the municipal power was down for several hours. But at the moment that transformer blew, it sent a power spike followed by an outage through the power lines. And when that hit the launch control facility, and, and just by way of background, you've got the launch control facility where the, the guys, the missile officers are located. And then every, I believe it's two nautical miles. Don't quote me on that. Nuclear blast radius apart then you've got all of the missiles in the flight. So all of these, you've got 10 missiles and you've got an 11th facility where the, where the guys are located. Um, once this power spike hit where the guys were located, it sent a particular burst of noise through a particular data line. Uh, and that triggered all 10 missiles to go into an LF no-go state, which means that they are unable to deliver their ordnance onto their target for any of a million reasons. And what happens in that case, when they got this burst of noise through the data line, they simply restarted. And it takes between 10 to 40 seconds for the missiles to restart themselves, kind of rebooting like a computer, the 1967 version of that. So it is an absolute fact that for uh, some 10 to 40 seconds, all 10 of these missiles were offline. But the cause isn't really a mystery. Um, we, know that this, we know that this power spike happened and we know which transformer it was at this particular substation. Um, and I asked, again, I asked my, my friend, does this happen often? That gets into national security. He's very good about not answering questions to get into national security. Even though these were Minuteman 2s and the Minuteman 2 is now a deprecated system, uh, there's still facts about them that are, that are classified. 
Uh, and he say all he would say is it's not unheard of. So missiles rebooting themselves for whatever reason um, was not unheard of. Um, in fact, in Salas's book, he talks to a guy whose job it was to go around and manually restart missiles that had failed to do so for whatever reason they had gone down. So apparently this is not unheard of often enough that they need someone to be in charge of, of handling it. And that, as far as I could find, was the extent of the story. Um, and now you've got a few decades later, um, Salas misremembering which flight he was working at. He thought it was Oscar and it was clearly it was Echo from all the documentation. Uh, so he rationalized in his mind, well, there, it must have happened twice then because I know that I was working at Oscar when this happened. Nobody else um, agrees with that. The documentation does not agree with that. It happened at Echo. And there was this UFO sighting in Belt, Montana, a week later, a week after this happened. And just in his own memory from several decades, he just conflated all these things together and decided, OK, a UFO flew over and deactivated flights, missiles at, at, at two of the flights. Um, I think that's that's the only it's certainly the best explanation for all the bits and pieces of the story, where almost all of the evidence that anything out of the ordinary is coming from one guy's memory. Wasn't there a number of Air Force personnel, not Robert Salas, but other Air Force personnel, those at the launch control facility and um, the security police who had UFO sightings at that time, in that time, in that time frame, let's put it that way. So that depends on who you ask. Um, the documentation, I mean, they have it, uh, shut that thing off to do not disturb. I forgot to do that. The documentation that, 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 um, that is in the Air Force report is uh, rumors of unidentified flying objects around the area of echo flight during the time of fault were disproven. A mobile strike team, which had checked all of November flight's launch facilities on the morning of 16 March 1967, were questioned and stated that no unusual activity or sightings were observed. Now, some of the people who worked there, the belt sightings were in the newspaper. I mean, people were talking about it. So they're going to remember it. And it's entirely reasonable that, I mean, who remembers the date that you heard a uh, UFO report? So it's entirely reasonable that some people may have said, hey, this might have happened on the same date, especially because this guy Solace is claiming so in his book. Well, the Condon Committee sent an investigator to Maelstrom Air Force Base to talk about the UFO sightings there. And uh, is it Lewis Chase or Chase Lewis? <laughs> I forget who it was. Who happens to be a lieutenant, was a lieutenant colonel at the time, another lieutenant colonel in the story. <laughs> Um, was questioned about that, and, and the investigator from Condon said, well, we, we heard there was a missile shutdown, and he said, I can't go into that. It's a matter of national security. Sure. Um, so we have, yeah, absolutely. So we you, have... You, UFOs notwithstanding, missiles shutting down is a matter of national security. Yeah, absolutely. Especially an outside force doing it. Because the last thing you would want our competitors to know is there is a possibility of shutting out the missile flights from outside the launch control facilities. So um, he wouldn't talk, Lewis wouldn't talk about um, the the sightings. Uh, Chase wouldn't, wouldn't talk about the sightings, uh, uh, the, the missile shutdown, but he did talk about the sightings. So you're suggesting that these two are, although they're located in a same general area in the same general time frame, they're really not connected by anything else. I couldn't find any reason to connect them. I mean, uh if if for some reason, let's say that we had uh, data, some kind of evidence that UFOs cause missiles to shut down. Let's say that that was a known characteristic of UFOs. If the UFOs had been sighted before this happened, well, then maybe you'd have something to talk about. But they didn't. They happened a week after all of this. Um, a week after the missiles rebooted themselves and were back in normal state. And the missiles did not go down again when the UFOs happened. So the UFOs were absolutely not connected to these missiles rebooting themselves. Robert Hastings, and I don't know if you came across his name in your research, yeah. did a book called UFOs and Nukes and uh, talked mm -hmm. to a number of missileers, I think they call themselves, um, about this happening at other locations. And the one that struck me was a fellow at, at uh, Warren Air Force Base, which is in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And the only reason I know that was because I was born in Cheyenne, Wyoming, and my grandparents lived about two 
blocks from the front gate. So I'm familiar with Warren Air Force Base, which was, by the way, a cavalry post in the 19th oh, century. Very fun. And 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 the, the the thing that we remember the museum there were there were signs that they had been posted in the buildings that said do not shoot buffalo out barracks windows so uh, <laughs> kind of moves it into that anyway but now it's a, a missile site but he talked to a number of missileers and as I said one guy at Cheyenne that talked about some of this happening periodically with other UFO sightings did you look at any of that sort of thing or did you just focus on the ones there in the in Montana I tried to I couldn't find any. I, I, I'm aware that Robert Hastings has mentioned them in his book, uh, UFOs and Nukes, Extraordinary Encounters at Nuclear Weapons Sites. Uh, that was the only source that I was able to find. You didn't talk to any of the missileers then? That were, I just were, talked to my one guy who, okay. he said if anything had happened anywhere, they would all know about it. I mean, you're talking about a very small fraternity. The um, well, There are a number of interviews in his book from, from people, and I've actually talked to a couple of the guys who were involved in some of these UFO sightings and around uh, missile silos. And I'm not sure that uh, they were talking about it shutting things down, but but sightings co-located with missile silos and that sort of thing. But I'm not sure that's a, a great connection to draw there. Yeah, I mean, like, like we said at the top of the show, people see UFOs all the time um, <laughs> uh, and things happen all the time. And the uh, idea that you are required to draw some kind of a causative connection, uh, I don't think is one that can be supported very well. I, you... I, I do want to say, I, I'm sorry, but in, I want to give Robert Solis some credit. In his book, he did include all of the affidavits that he asked his, um, his colleagues to write. And even the ones that vehemently disagreed with him, he included them in his book. And I think, I think he deserves credit for including the opposing viewpoint. Um, Solace, I, 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 from my, my conversation with, uh, I'm trying to phrase this logically, uh, call it, Solace suggested that in his flight, not all of the missiles were shut down, just part of them, uh, or he believes they all were, but his, um, commander, the commander in this, in the silo thought it was only part of them, um, did you talk to Solace about this or did you just go from the documentation? No, I was going from the documentation, and that is a point that's unclear, how many of the missiles in the flight were affected. At one point in uh, Boeing's report, it did say that all 10, and I feel that's probably the most reliable. Okay. So I'm going with all 10, but I mean, it, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Well, I guess the thing that's confusing me is there was one flight, let's say, where all sh missiles were shut down. Solace, I thought, was talking about another flight in which a similar event happened in the days following the first event. And it may have shut down part of the missiles or all of the missiles in that flight as well. And I, is there two separate events like that that you're aware of, or is it just a single event? I think, I think the Air Force documentation just talks about the single event. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, that's mostly from the Freedom of Information Act response. I'm not sure who filed that or when, but it's got, that's the best collection of all the information. Um, I, and I know in his book, he talks about uh, uh, there having been another incident. But again, from talking to my friend and from um, there, I believe there was an affidavit from this guy whose job was to go around and, and restart missiles that had shut themselves down. Um, in, in, in Hal's terminology, this was not unheard of. So I think we can say, yes, of course, other missiles had shut down for one reason or another. Um, that just seems to be the normal course of business. Okay, well, let's uh, let's move on from there. I'm going to take a break, and we'll come back, and we'll talk about uh, something else maybe. Uh, your website is skeptoid.com. You can find more information about that, uh, this information, and uh, other sightings at that site. We will be back right after this, so please stick around. <laughs> And we are back. I'm here with Brian Dunning. We were talking about the missile shutdowns at Maelstrom Air Force Base and Belt Montana sightings. I think we pretty well eliminated that uh, that case here. I think that uh, the sightings at Belt might be very interesting, might have a great deal to do with UFOs. And I'll post a little bit more about that uh, to my blog for those who are interested in it. But uh, from his point of view, and I think uh, 
probably a logical point of view that the, the missile shutdown had little to do with the UFO sightings. But you had mentioned you were uh, interested in cattle mutilations. I saw something on your, on your website that suggested uh, an interest in cattle mutilations. Um, so tell me a little bit about uh, what you've done there. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a science writer. I work for a nonprofit and it's something different every week. So I've covered just about anything and everything. So yeah, cattle mutilation is in that mix somewhere. Well, I got a, I got a call from a, uh, a reporter from our local newspaper here who told me that out in uh, a, a town probably 30, 40 miles away, there's been a rash of cattle mutilations. And the sheriff out there uh, was convinced that it was Satan worshipers uh, were responsible for this. And so he wrote up a, a paper for the judge in support of trying to get himself a search warrant, allowing him to have access to the um, cell phone location data of literally anyone that they suspect of having been connected to these cattle mutilations. Now, from a constitutional law standpoint, that is ridiculously extreme overreach. I was going to say um, it's awfully, it is very frightening that you could have something that vague. I want anybody's cell phone that I want to check because they might be involved. It, who I, anyone who I think I suspect, or I say yes. I suspect. And uh, the search warrant was granted. Now, I haven't heard back from my friend to say here what, what repercussions there may have been about that. But to me, that was a, that was a very graphic illustration of how misinformation um, or um, I don't mean to, this to have a negative connotation, but ignorance uh, can, be, can be misused and abused. Um, a little bit of science literacy would do everyone a, a big favor, especially this particular sheriff. Um, we had presented to him uh, information on how and why cattle mutilation happens naturally as a result of bird and insect predation within literally within just a few hours of the cow dropping dead. Um, and he was basically had no interest in that at all. In his mind, it was Satan worshipers. And that was the end of it. Well, let me interrupt here because I know there was a case yes. in Arkansas in 1976, 1978 timeframe where they had come across a recently deceased cow and they watched it for 24 hours or 48 hours yeah. or two days, watched it for two days. And what they saw was the sort of things that you got in a mutilation were the result of, as you said, the natural predation, the, the insects, the birds, the small scavengers, getting at the soft tissues and that sort of thing. And there was yeah. a picture that they, they showed, and I always, I always laughed at it. I said, well, we were there at this cow and there were no footprints around it. We don't understand how you could say it was predators. And I think, did you see the bird droppings all over the cow? <laughs> yeah. But so uh, what I'm saying there, that kind of information, I think, should have made an impression on the sheriff if that was presented to him, that another sheriff had done this sort of thing. Yeah. And, and I'm sure that information has made an impression on some sheriffs, but, uh, you know, everyone has, we all have our blind spots, you and me included. Um, I always try to remember that some of the things that I believe are wrong um, and some of the things that you believe are wrong. And, and I think everyone would do themselves a favor by accepting that fact and starting trying to actively seek out what those are so we can fix them. Uh, and this is something that this particular sheriff just had in his mind that uh, the cause of cattle mutilation is Satan worshipers in the story. So he was uh, not at all interested in, you know, whatever those those damn scientists have to say with their well, I would protectors. I would point out that back when I was invited into the investigation, which would be 1976, I believe, Jim Lorenzen from April had called me and said there were some cattle mutilations up in Minnesota. And would I go look at those? And I said, sure. Well, I didn't want to look at the mutilations, but would I go investigate? And I said, sure. And at the time, the idea was it was Satan worshippers doing it. I think there was a guy named uh, Don Flickinger who was a member of the... Yeah. Um, ATF, which is now something different, because we have to change the acronyms periodically to keep the public in. <laughs> but um, had talked to an inmate, was talking about the Satan worshippers. But when we got up there, and I say we, Bob Cornett and I went up there and talked to a number of people. We talked to the farmers, we talked to the news media and all that. And the idea that it was some kind of satanic worship just didn't pan out. Um, and, and from that point on, I saw Ken Rommel's report. I'm not sure you're familiar with that. Mm -mm. 
Ken Rommel was a retired FBI agent who was hired by the state of New Mexico to look at the cattle mutilations in uh, the late 1970s, that time frame. And his conclusion was uh, scavengers and predators who were responsible for the mutilations. And it, his report is like 297 pages long. He actually sent me a copy of it, which I thought was kind of nice of him because I called him to talk to him. I said, well, give me your address and I'll send you a copy, which he did. Um, so I've been of the opinion since that point that that there is nothing mysterious about the cattle mutilations other than the phenomenon that's been built up around it. Uh, yeah. And I'm surprised that it's still going on the way it is. I think Tucker Carlson has now um, done his best to enliven that situation with his documentary, which I refuse to pay for the firewall or the paywall to, to see his documentary. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it helps you understand why this sheriff, though, if, if Tucker Carlson is promoting it today, um, you know, that's that's demographically probably exactly where this particular sheriff comes from. This is Eastern Oregon, after all. You know, it, it's interesting that you mentioned this happened in the 1970s because that was the height of the satanic panic, you know, which was yes. a major cultural trend when there was this wave of belief that swept over the nation that there was such a thing as Satan worshipers. And there never really was. I mean, there's there's little churches of Satan and so forth, but they're mostly satirical. Uh, just excuses for people who are not non-religious to do charitable stuff. But this whole thing with, I mean, you remember stories of uh, babies being skinned and being roasted alive and things like this. This was all part of the satanic panic. None of that ever happened. And yet it became a major cultural trend. And it drove in part things like this, the cattle mutilation. I'm not sure that the, well, the idea that it drove the cattle mutilation, I think the cattle mutilations were actually beginning prior to the satanic panic sweeping the country. But yeah, they were oh, in the same time frame. I, I mean, it, it drove that explanation for the, for the cattle mutilations. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I was told by somebody once, if you take a private plane up on the satanic holidays, You'll see the bonfires all over the countryside with a satanic worship. Yeah. Sure. yeah. But I was never able to find them. I think there probably are some people who take it very seriously, but it's a very small number of people and they're not out there mutilating cattle. Yeah, and, there, there is a there. You can come up with just about anything. And somewhere in the world, there's a very, very small group of people who take it very seriously. But by and large, if you find a Satan worshiper, it's going to be for some satirical church of Satan or whatever. And, and is very harmless. What sort of evidence did the sheriff have that he thought proved it was satanic worshipers? Um, let's see. I, ha I, I mean, have his, I have the letter that he wrote to the judge in support of this warrant. And he gave some of that. Uh, and what he was talking about was basically stories from the internet. He was copying, pasting stories from the internet about satanic ritual abuse and, and things like this, and other cases where people had believed Satan worshipers were behind cattle mutilation. He did not present any evidence from any of the locations at the site. He didn't say, oh, you know, we found a bloody crucifix or something at this site. Uh, it was all just basically internet stories uh, that this guy has clearly taken to heart. Uh, and and I, the, it's it's why the judge. Well, I was going to say I'm concerned about this judge here. What is his is his background very impressive, or is it like some places where you elect the judges and they don't really have to have a law degree? <laughs> I I don't know anything about this judge, so it would be pure oh. speculation. <laughs> uh, obviously, the sheriff went out and looked at some of the dead cows. Yeah, yeah, they did, and they had some pictures, and they. Um, the pictures were exactly like what we've seen before. The uh, the soft tissues, the anus, the lips, the eyes uh, were the first to go. Uh, I think one of them showed a slice on the abdomen. And you, you know how the, w w as the skin dries and it pulls tight, uh, any little hole will, will get stretched out into a very sharp edged slice. And for anything, it, it does look like someone took a scalpel and made this very precise incision because it looks the edges look perfect. And that's just a factor of the way the, the skin dries and, and pulls back tight. And so his pictures are compelling. If you don't know anything about this, and maybe the judge is one of those people, and here's someone showing you these very weird pictures, 
that look like, man, you can only imagine a scalpel must have done that. And he says, here's all these stories from the internet that satanic worshipers are doing this to cows. It's not that far fetched to suspect though, maybe this judge was, he, he, he bought, he felt that was compelling enough because he, he didn't have any better ideas. Well, again, again I, going I, back to a bit of science literacy will do everyone some good. I, I am more concerned about the judge granting this really vague search warrant than being yeah. overwhelmed by this evidence or the supposed evidence, I should say. Yeah, um, yeah. So, but on the sites of the mutilations, were all the cows grouped together or was it cows over a, a wide range, wide, wide, wide range area? I remember, I remember one picture uh, clearly enough to tell you what was in the background and there were no other cows visible. I couldn't really tell you anything else about um, the location or where it was found, except that it was on a, it was on a cattle ranch. Well, we're going to have to take another break here. I think it's a good place to take a break here because we're talking about cow, okay. cow anuses. And I think I've always wondered if cow <laughs> anus was a del delicacy on another planet. And that was why they always, the, the UFOs always got that part of it. Anyway, the <laughs> website again is uh, skeptoid.com. I don't know why I have to keep looking at my paper because I should be able to remember that. Mine is www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. And I'm going to have a couple of pieces about cattle nation cattle mutilations up there in the next couple of days, which is not going to throw my friend Chris O'Brien about that. But there's uh, some in interesting things going on there. As, as I say, I think we're on agreement on this, that there's uh, more of a natural explanation for this than there is um, some kind of mysterious uh, thing going on there. We will be back right after this. So please stick around. All right. And we are back. We're talking about cattle mutilations, unfortunately. I thought I'd mention to you that um, one of the things I looked into was a report from Dubuque, Iowa, where a bunch of cattle had been killed by a gas grenade and then mutilated, uh, which on the surface is kind of frightening you know, that somebody's got a gas grenade like that. Yeah. Well, hopefully well, that case is an outlier. Well, but but it, it, the cows died of black legs, so... And I, I talked to a vet in Wisconsin. I always remembered his name was Jefferson Davis. I thought that's a weird name for a guy in Wisconsin. But he was talking about um, another aspect of this that shows there are real mutilations going on. He uh, was approached by a farmer who, well, he worked with, a dairy farmer, and uh, said that his cow had been mutilated and the air had been cut off and things like that. Hmm. Uh, but what the vet said to me was the cow had been sickly from birth and had the cow died of natural causes, the farmer got no insurance money. But if the mutilators got it, then the insurance paid off. So there was a financial component to that one. But what made it worse is some guy showed up in the big van that said UFO investigator on the side. And he says, every time we get a UFO sighting, now we get a cattle mutilation. Uh, yeah. And the other thing, the, 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 the thing about you saying, you saying about science and, and I'll, I wanted to mention this, is one person challenged me, said, well, how do you explain the lack of copper in the blood of some of the animals? And I thought, well, that's a darn good question. How do I explain that? And unlike your sheriff, pal, I went onto the internet and I found a bunch of science journals and explained exactly why there'd be a lack of copper in the blood of cattle. And in some locations, I, I think Utah springs to my mind, they feed copper supplements to the cattle so that they have the proper amount of copper in their blood. So um, even these anomalous findings, you might say, are not that anomalous at all. They, they take care of that. Uh, yeah. Was there any sort of necropsy uh, um, performed on the, on the cattle that you were aware of, or was it just the sheriff's observations? Yes, there had been. Um, the, the, the vet determined that the cow had died of natural causes. And I believe it was as simple as that. I don't think they were able to say, I mean, sometimes they just die, I, I guess. I, there was no specific... <laughs> Um, I mean, there was no wounds that had caused its death. It had just died of natural causes. And it may be that that's as far as they leave it. If there was any toxicology done, um, it was not reported. Well, I was going to say a snake bite might have done something. I don't know what the prevalence of rattlesnakes in Oregon is. Um, but I know that's a problem in like New Mexico and some of those areas. They're here for sure. Yeah. But, but, uh, but yeah, with Without it being reported, I just don't know. So uh, your study of the cattle mutilations was, wasn't was 
quite as in depth as mine, apparently. <laughs> no, I mean, I've, I've got a weekly show, so I've got a week to spend on each subject. I'm not able to go into the, the depth that I would like to. I mean, every time I do a show, it's like, my God, this was fascinating. This was so much fun. I wish I could spend a year and make a whole documentary film on just this. But no, I've got to do something next week. <laughs> what uh, so, what topics do you explore on that? I'm sure it's not just related to the paranormal and, and UFOs and that sort of thing. Do you do what other topics do you get into? Well, we're, we're an educational nonprofit and our our mission statement is to promote science literacy and critical thinking. So what we look for are fun things in pop culture that are that everyone would like to hear about because it's an interesting subject. And ideally, we're looking for something where a lot of people believe something that's not true. But when you dig into it, you find a lot more interesting true history or true science behind it. So everyone comes away with a positive lesson going, hey, that was neat. So this can include anything from um, conspiracy theories. We do that a lot. Um, paranormal claims, alternative medicine schemes, urban legends, um, pretty much the whole gamut. You know, if a, a lot of my friends who are science writers and science communicators and, and working research scientists as well, we all got our start by buying all the ghost books, all the Bigfoot books, all the UFO books, and believing every word that was in them. And, and just being so fascinated with the subject that as you get older, you decide you want to find out, hey, what was really going on here? I'd really like to know. And so that's how I got into doing what I do. Uh, finding the real solutions is, for me, uh, so much more rewarding than just stopping at the version that they want to tell you on the History Channel and say, aliens built the pyramids, that's all there is to it. No no debate allowed. Well, what, what's your feeling about NASA now looking into the UFO phenomenon? Is that a good idea or a bad idea? I, I think it's a bad idea uh, because it's 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 giving oxygen to an idea that I don't think deserves any. Um, and, and, and I say this from a, I, I, sh I should say that I'm, I'm in the middle of producing a, a, a feature documentary about the UFO phenomenon right now. And the position that we're taking um, is that we're talking about the true science behind physics and exobiology and everything else that whatever your position is on ufos this movie will help you bolster that with some good science so it's not a movie that takes a position per se one way or the other um i think we can say for sure though that we do not have any reasonable evidence that earth has been visited by extraterrestrials we've got a ton of very bad evidence but no really good evidence. What would you consider good evidence in the few minutes we have left? Yeah, I mean, this has been talked about a lot. It's like if you had a, a chunk of metal that was isotopically so improbable on Earth, a friend of mine who was a calibration scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope, they had a little chunk of, oh, I want to say palladium, but that's probably wrong. It cost them $100,000 to get this one because it had to be isotopically pure. So at some point, if you're going to provide a piece of metal that's too improbable to be um, to exist on Earth because of its isotopic makeup, that's going to cost you millions of dollars potentially to make that. And so we're not going to see that hoaxed very likely. I mean, that's the kind of thing. But then we've got other things like radio signals, like the wow signal still remains. Its best explanation is a, a radio signal from a point in space in the direction of that particular uh, constellation that it came from, uh, and everything else is pretty much eliminated. There's a lot of very interesting stuff to talk about. There's a lot of very fascinating things happening in the world of uh, astrobiology right now. Uh, with James Webb Space Telescope, is probably not quite able to resolve the atmospheres of exoplanets to see what kind of life exists on them. But the next generation of space telescopes absolutely will have that resolution. And so, what about, what about Avi Loeb and his um, uh, yeah. project Galileo? You're familiar with that, I, I'm sure. Yes, I am. I, I, I think he is also someone who's not doing any good. He's taking a very fringe perspective and he's giving it all of the trappings of legitimate scientists, science. And I think he's fooling a lot of people into thinking that this is, you know, not so much a fringe perspective. So I don't think he's doing any good. Um, I, I think of things like the Leveland sightings, and I'm 
probably I'm getting pretty sure you're not that familiar with them. No. It was an event that took place in November of 1957. I bring them up on the program periodically because I think it's a very important sighting and, and it's we're going to run out of time here. Uh, people at uh, 13 separate lo 13 separate locations that we can document, probably many more, including the sheriff, including Air Force officers, witnessed this object as it approached their cars. It stalled the engines. It um, dimmed the headlights, which may be a result of st uh, stopping the engines, filled the radios with static, left landing traces on the ground, um, independently reported throughout the area over a period of about three hours in Level Land, Texas. And I think that would be the kind of sighting that would have demanded at the time a better investigation than it got. And I, I think that might be something that uh, if it had happened today, we might have gotten a better, better understanding of some of the UFO phenomenon. Uh, and, and I know it's not fair to ask you, well, what do you think about that without having all the facts in front of you other than my very brief description of it? But wouldn't that be yeah, something I mean, interesting to I, look I, at? You're, you're right. If that had happened today, everyone there would have had their cell phone recording it, and we'd have quite a bit of actual evidence of, of what happened. Um, and in so many of these cases, you know, you, you study interrogation techniques, and when something happens and there's multiple witnesses, what's the very first thing the police do is they separate everyone, put them in different rooms, interview them individually so that their stories can't cross-contaminate and influence one another. And so many of these stories like this, where we basically have a, you know, an, an anecdote that's decades old uh, and, and a bunch of people all saying more or less the same thing. And the only thing we know is that the evidence was not collected properly, that we, there's probably never, no way to ever find out what actually did take place because the well, eyewitness would, accounts were were hopelessly contaminated. I would say that there was no opportunity for the, a lot of the witnesses to have, be contaminated, given the given it was 1957 and it wasn't on their cell phones, it wasn't over the news media right away, and the, although it wasn't a proper interrogation, there were questions being asked of the witnesses they called into the sheriff's office, so they were getting the stories from independent witnesses who had no opportunity to see what other people had, had said. So I think that's yeah. what makes it an important sighting. I would love to learn more about that. I mean, a, a, a lot of my, when you, when you ask me my first reaction to something that I'm hearing for the first time, I'm going yes. on the experience of having looked at so many stories and so many commonalities that we find time and time again in these stories. And that's one of them. Well, and, and that's the thing. I, I understand that, uh, that you have absolutely no knowledge of this case. And I bring it up periodically to fool skeptics, I suppose. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, did a, I did a book. I did a book called Level Land where I explored this thing in depth. And the Air Force didn't have a proper investigation for one thing, and they didn't have a proper answer for it. It should have been labeled unidentified as opposed to ball lightning. And we could argue about the reality of ball lightning if we wanted to, but it didn't seem like that would be a legitimate explanation for a series of sightings that took place over a period of two and a half to three hours in, in various locations around level land in Lubbock, Texas, 1957. Very cool. I'll look forward to hearing about that one. Uh, the book's available on Amazon. <laughs> right. Uh, sorry about the commercial there. Um, Brian Dunning, I want to thank you for taking time to talk with us today. I think it's a very fascinating discussion, and I appreciate uh, your points of view on many of these sorts of things. I'm going to look a little bit more into the um, Belt, Montana, Maelstrom Air Force Base sightings and check that out a little bit deeper. But th thank you much for that. As I say, the um, uh, website is Skeptoid.com, and you said you had a, a podcast or a radio show? Yeah, the podcast is Skeptoid.com, and the movie I'm working on, you'll find it at theufo.movie. You can okay. watch the trailer for it and all of that stuff. Well, thank you very much for taking your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you, Kevin. It's been great Thanks. talking with you. All right. Uh, next week, I'm going to be talking to John Greenwald. We're going to be looking at the HODL memo that uh, he just got the unredacted version of, which is a UFO landing in... Uh, uh, a series of UFO landings or UFO crashes, I suppose, that sort of thing. And in uh, coming weeks, I'm going to talk in depth about uh, cattle mutilations, and Tom Carey will be coming back to talk a little bit more about his experiences in the Roswell case and UFO investigation. Hey, thanks for uh, tuning in and taking a look at us. Uh, if you get a chance, take a look at Level Land, take a chance, take a look at Understanding Roswell, and I'll be back in 167 hours. Thank you. <laughs>